Hello and welcome to the very first episode of Face to Face for the New Year. My name is Godfred Akuto Boafo. My guest for today is a former lecturer, communications one at that, a two-time campaign strategist, a former minister of sports. Today he is the National Elections Director of the National Democratic Congress. Elvis Efriya Ankara is our guest on Face to Face. Mr. Friyanka, Happy New Year. Many, many happy returns. It's a pleasure coming across you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're looking very well too. Thank you very much as well. Here yeah, we were thinking 2020, good year, NDC is going to concentrate on its manifesto, find itself a running mate. You begin the year chasing the EC over voters register. What's going on? Because the credibility of every election depends on the credibility of the register. And unfortunately, we've had an EC that has not been transparent. They've not been candid with us when it comes to this issue of a voter's register. And they have conducted in themselves in a manner that does not engender confidence. Mm. Time-tested um, principles and systems that have been put in place at IPAC have been jettisoned by this current EC due to their posturing that um, they are not bound by the decisions of IPAC they are independent and therefore they will do whatever they want to do. And uh, we think that that is the root cause of all the problems we have now. Uh, let me hold you there. Is it not that perhaps political parties or the NDC is not used to having an assertive electoral commission and so feels that the intention of this EC perhaps to assert itself has been comprehended as arrogant, as being intransigent, as being an EC that doesn't listen, is that not perhaps how this is? No EC chairperson has been more assertive than Dr. Kujo Afarijan. There's a world of a difference between being assertive and just applying simple rules of governance. You know, uh, when it comes to governance, governing an institution, you have the legal framework, you also have a consultative process. And they'll tell you that if you're going to um, 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 bring out any policy, stakeholder consultation and buying is critical. And so those are time-tested principles mm. that any manager of an institution, um, not even a, a, a sensitive institution as an e electoral commission, where issues regarding elections, voter management, etc., could lead to political instability. That is all the more reason why you need that approach, consensus mm. building, stakeholder buying, you know. And fortunately, we've had this IPAC since uh, 1994, and it's, proven, it's been proven over time. There are many, many, many reforms in our electoral system that came through the IPAC. Nobody is contesting the independence of the EC, but independence must be put within a proper contextual framework, mm. because the EC is not operating on an island. They are not an electoral commission unto themselves. They are electoral commission providing service to the people of Ghana and the political parties. The political parties are major stakeholders. And it's for good reason that the previous EC, mm -hmm. before they introduced this biometric, new biometric register, engaged in a process of stakeholder consultation. There were two committees that were formed, a technical committee and a legal committee. And they had representatives, NDC had a rep, the MPP had a rep, the smaller parties had a rep, civil society had a rep, donor community had a rep, together with the EC's own technical team. And they sat down and engaged at committee level, <coughs> discussed, looked at the modalities, looked at the specifications, what do we want, what are the safeguards that we can put in place. Because IT also has its own challenges. That's People right. can ex take advantage of the system. And so with that understanding, common understanding, then they went ahead and did the procurement. So there was buy-in. You have a situation where, and I'm saying this on authority, that we have never, not once, had a formal IPAC meeting that the EC has tabled the question of a new biometric register. What the EC sought to do on the 27th of March, we had an IPAC meeting. And I have the minutes here. I yes. Have, um, every, everything is document, you know. I'll prove everything. It was not on the agenda? It was not on the agenda. And so they came, and uh, there were three things, major things on the agenda, preparations for district 
2019 district level elections and referendum, mm -hmm. inspection of political party offices, and updates on the compliance of the parties with audit requirements. So these were the three major items on the 27th of March. They were discussed for three and a half hours. In the course of the discussion, somebody asked a question. So what are some of the challenges with the equipment that mm -hmm. we've had in the past? And <clears throat> she intimated that they intended to procure new equipment. Nobody, not even MPP and DC said a word because that was not the item on the agenda. It was yeah. after we had all the discussions, somebody just asked in passing. So for a three and a half hour meeting, that explanation took about a minute. Okay. Only for us to come out of the meeting and the EC does a press release. Mm -hmm. It came out at 9 p.m. And they said the EC has con concluded a stakeholders meeting today under the ages of IPAC and the discussions were centered on the following pertinent matters. And indeed, they talked about the three things that were on the mm -hmm. item. Then they said, after extensive deliberations, the following key decisions were made and adopted by the meeting. Then one relevant, two relevant, four, five, all relevant, three, the commission will compile a new voters register ahead of the 2020 presidential and parliamentary elections. Where was this on the agenda? Where were the extensive deliberations? So this is evidence for you that the commission deliberately sought to lie and misinform the public that political parties had agreed at IPAC. This is documentary proof. Mm -hmm. And we came out with a very strong worded uh, press statement that no, there was no such discussion, no such deliberation at IPAC. We issued a strongly worded statement. Subsequently, when we went to the subsequent IPAC, they apologized and they withdrew it and they adjusted the minutes of the meeting to show that indeed such a thing did not uh, happen. So this is where the whole issue began. Issue began. You see, so they created that problem. And it's, it's interesting that since that time, mm -hmm. 27th of March mm -hmm. 2019, there was never, quote me, never ever any formal IPAC meeting with an agenda, let's discuss biometric registration. On the 25th of November, mm -hmm. we were invited to an emergency IPAC meeting. That emergency IPAC meeting was meant to discuss preparations for the district level elections and the referendum. Mm -hmm. It was an emergency IPAC meeting. We raised issues, why do you call us for an emergency meeting? Okay, and then in the course of the deliberations, they then brought up the question of a biometric register. So we said, no, you cannot call us to an emergency meeting <clears throat> and then smuggle in the question of a biometric register. It's a major item. Mm -hmm. So call a proper meeting and let's discuss it. Then they called us for another emergency meeting on the 2nd of December. So second emergency meeting back to back. Okay. Now, somebody will say, well, meeting is meeting. It's not. The lawyers will tell you that an ordinary meeting has a different legal context than an, a, an emergency meeting. If you do emergency meeting back to back, what happens is that you don't have the opportunity to look at minutes of the previous meeting, look at decisions that were taken, and on that basis have meaningful discussion. So it was deliberate. So emergency meeting, emergency meeting. When they presented, they did their presentation on the reasons why they wanted a biometric register, our IT people also brought out a lot of Counterfactual. Like that, what? Because I've seen uh, the statements the EC put out, the public case the EC made put out by Mr. Samuel Tete, okay. a 16 point. Good. Uh, so statement. you can bring each one of them. Yes, and for instance, let's talk about the fact that the machines are obsolete. Let's start from there. That's basically okay. they're saying, well, we simply cannot move ahead with this because mm -hmm. it has reached an expiration date. Mm -hmm. And we do know mm -hmm. that technology does have an expiration mm -hmm. date. Mm -hmm. What is your problem with that? So, um, first of all, unfortunately, the EC are not the sole um, repository <coughs> of knowledge and understanding when it comes to IT systems. So if anybody tells you that you bought a equipment and seven years down the line they are obsolete, you don't just take it hook, line, and sinker. You examine it. How come that a seven-year system that was installed seven years ago is obsolete? When did they realize it was obsolete? Those are the questions that they've been asked. You used it for uh, 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 create, creation of regions. You did a limited registration exercise and exhibition. You did a district assembly elections. And the district assembly elections are much more complex because you are electing over almost 7,000 assemblymen. You are electing about 33,000 unit committee members. That is more complex and cumbersome. They'll talk about the numbers. But 
the fact that there's a lot of pressure on the system. And they themselves declared that election as very, very credible. The, 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 the uh, register, the claim was very, very credible, and they patted themselves at the back. So at what point did they realize that indeed it, the, 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 the systems were obsolete? So it's not true. Other experts will tell you that the lifespan of those equipment is 15, 20 years. Mm, worst case scenario, you need an upgrade. So that position is totally untenable. But they are saying then that the upgrades go hand in hand with a certain kind of cost. Mm -hmm. It goes with data storage. Mm -hmm. One, the data center that they have at the moment mm -hmm. is obsolete as well. It keeps breaking down. They say, for instance, that the vendor's cost for upgrade and maintenance is also as high as perhaps buying new ones. So why not buy new ones? Since they are the implementing authority, why don't you simply trust that they are making the best decisions for their budget and for Ghanaians? So they told us at the meeting mm -hmm. that there were three major reasons. When we presented our counterfactuals and they said that it was going to cost more mm -hmm. to upgrade the system mm -hmm. than to get new equipment. So we asked for more and better particulars they brought in their director of procurement. The director of procurement came. We asked him, how much is it going to cost? He said, um, about seven million, about 10 million. What is the actual figure? He couldn't say. So we said, look, maybe you were called impromptu. So in order to avoid any controversy, go back and give us the details. So at the end of that meeting, we asked for three things. One, they said there was a consultant's report. They've mm -hmm. been talking about consultant report, both a local consultant and a foreign consultant. So we said, give us that report so that we'll have the benefit of looking at that report objectively so that we can uh, uh, make an informed decision. Number two, give us the cost of the upgrade because we need to know. Mm -hmm. And then three, give us the cost of getting the new one. So these are three things that all the parties, this one not only NDC, all the parties agreed that we need these three documents. They agreed that they were going to give it to us. <coughs> we followed up with a letter to them. We wrote specifically mm -hmm. and asked for these three documents. Did this, this was the, on the 2nd of December. We wrote around the 5th of December. As I speak to you today, we have not received a response. Only for us to be called for a, a, a tender review process on the 10th of December. So we, we realized it, it, was, it was very insulting. You but hold on for me. Okay, sure. On procurement, there's a procurement board. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to have a member of parliament from the NDC on it. Mm -hmm. Is he on it? He's supposed to be on it. What does he tell you? Well... That's Dr. Dominic Aine. Okay, I don't even... I, it's not even about whether it's Dr. Dominic Aine. No, but these processes cannot happen hold on. without going through hold, procurement. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Whether it is Dr. Dominic Aine or it is the flag bearer. That is inconsequential. Okay. We wrote asking for documents. documents. We are IPAC. You want our inputs and our buy-in. We need information to be able to do, make informed decisions. At the meeting, you promised all of us, in the presence of all of us, and there are records to show that you are going to make those documents available. Then we don't hear from you. You don't make those documents available. A week after, Tenth, you say we should come and help you to 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 determine in, in, or out of the four dens, four vendors which one would choose. Does it make sense to you? It, it, when we it, went it, to school, didn't we pass our exams? It sounds like you're a communications expert. Uh -huh. it, it looks like there's a lot of mixed signals, miscommunication because it is not, this goes it, back and forth. It is not mixed. But you see, I, I wish that the situation was different, honestly and sincerely. <clears throat> you know, when they came first and they did this. Um, let, let's say for but one of this yes, miscommunication, the miscommunication. It was very suspicious. But well, they just took office. You know, you give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe it was not intended or whatever. So we, we subsequently that's when they started doing the engagements, mm -hmm. and we met them with our flag bearer. You know, I was yes. in that meeting. Believe me, that meeting they virtually swore that they were going to do things differently in a very transparent manner. And the sad part is that I believe them. That is what hurts me most. I actually believe them that they were sincere and genuine. This could have been a mistake, so they were going to do things better. And the flag bearer said, look, a lot of water has passed under there. Because at that meeting, I told them, I said, you, you defiled us. Hmm. Yes, you defiled us. You Strong see, words. We, yes, we came into that meeting. I came into that meeting like a virgin with sincerity. And you defiled us. You broke the trust by 
putting out this falsehood, blatant, deliberate falsehood, because you cannot tell me that they didn't know what they were doing. And everybody said, okay, we're going to start on a new leaf, water under the bridge, and we, we actually believe them. I did. I believe them. So if you observe, for a very long time, even when they did something, I never spoke. Mm. I was trying to engage them at meetings, at meetings. But they have proven beyond all reasonable doubt that they are not sincere. If you look at the trajectory of events, why would you not just put this on the agenda? New biometric register, let's discuss. Okay, you didn't put it on the agenda. You called for a meeting. You said you give us three documents. You, you promised us. Okay, we subsequently wrote for the documents. You have not given us the documents. And then you asked us to go for a tender review and approve companies. No, that's a total insult. You don't respect us. You take us for granted. It's totally wrong. And what are they hiding? Yesterday, you think they are hiding something? Well, yesterday was the first time I heard figures on air. Most of the information, we get it on air. If they had written to us, given us that document, mm -hmm. and then given us the cost, we then would have looked at the cost and looked at those figures and written back so there will be a paper trail. And today we'll be talking based on... They didn't do it. So what is it that they are hiding? Why can they not be open, transparent, as their predecessors did? What, what is the problem? So, and you, you, they, are, they are just not making sense. Today, the register is overstretched, whatever that means. In technical terms, there's nothing like overstretched. If you have a data center, one of the things they told us at the meeting was that the data room is too hot. Yes, they said the cooling system. So if your cooling down. system is hot, my brother, eh, like this room, if our cooling systems, they decide that, they, they, let's assume this is our data room, and the cooling system may be because of the machines we are using. Don't you just change it and upgrade it? In any case, information is coming out that even for data, uh, you don't even need to have your own data center. The government of Ghana has spent over 47 million cities and built a world-class state of the art data center that can manage all data, the best in the whole of West Africa. So what is it about the data center? Would you trust that that data will be sent there, the but, NDC? But, 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 but the point is that data, even for your banks and many other institutions that work, data is, is not, there are a lot of institutions that are very, very sensitive. It is the access that is the most important. Mm -hmm. Data is taught. You see, they, they talk as if, first of all, a little knowledge is dangerous. And yesterday, Dr. Bosman Asari you know, demonstrated it. I'm sure he was briefed, but he did not anticipate the follow-up questions. And he ended up messing up himself. It was a disaster. And I felt very, very sorry for him. You mean in his interview with Bernard? Yes, it was, it was a disaster. You understand me? You, they asked him, okay, did you engage the EC? And in the morning, he had lied on a sister radio station. He was asked directly because I was listening to him. And I sent a question. I said, ask him, has he engaged the political parties? He said, yes, they did. They engaged the political parties. A total lie. He hasn't. I've proven it to you. He did. They have not. You know, and he said, well, um, when the matter came up and they made a comment, none of the parties objected. So then Bernard asked him, so you take that to mean approval? He says, yes. I mean, how can you do this to yourself, a PhD holder? So you see, they are not being consistent. They are not being truthful. And because they are not being truthful, you watch. By next week, the narrative will change again. You ask me you any, so? any of the, I've, I've, I've shown you question of data center. It doesn't hold water question of a uh, uh, cooling system it doesn't hold water or well, the they've spoken about the capacity of the machines to mm -hmm. perform mm -hmm. in the face of extreme numbers mm -hmm. and that the margin of error if taken into per extrapolation if taken into a national election for instance could be an one that could decide the election it is something that they want to avoid considering the state of you, you know that you know the numbers you're talking about they're saying that in this election we have we had 5.4 people million people mm -hmm. and there were 34,000 people who could not be verified 34 35,000 now what is the percentage of that that was the initial one of their strongest points yeah. that because of manual verification therefore they want to bring in face uh, facial yes. recognition to augment now, manual verification, I said one of the, the thumb prints, yeah. the thumb print has been proven scientifically, and this is not me saying it, it's been proven scientifically that it has 99.6% or 99.4% success rate. There is no system. It, the scientists will tell you, even when it comes to 
atomic rocket science. Uh, you cannot have 99.4% success rate. So that's almost 100% success rate. 100% success rate. Meanwhile, the fissure technology that they say they are bringing, mm -hmm. because there are, there's a 4% margin of error with the fingerprints, okay? That fissure technology has a success rate of about 85%. And even with that 85%, when it comes to Africans, uh, and the, the information is available. I'm not making it up. It's easily available. Go to BBC and Google. When it comes to Africans, they, they have major issues that the, the facial technology has challenges identifying Africans, Asians. And in some instances, when you, for instance, if you take the picture today, and by the time of the election, you've grown a beard or you've had some cuts in your face, the system is unable to recognize it. And these facts are facts that have been proven by independent scientific analysis. I'm not making it up. Mm. So the system that has 99.4% success rates, and you say because of that, you're going to bring a system that has 85% success rate, does it make sense to you? So, so you know, you, they, they say this, when you bring counterfactuals, then they shift the goalposts, then they say something else, they're just not making sense. All right, then you are watching face to face with the Director of Elections of the National Democratic Congress, Mr. Elvis F. Frianka. We'll take a quick break. When we return, we'll go more on the way forward. Welcome back to Face to Face with Mr. Elvis F. Frianka, who had, you, you, you've made quite the case for your party's position. But the EC is determined to see this through. They have a budget, it's been approved in Parliament. You seem to be resorting to other means. You've done demonstrations. It does not seem to be making the kind of impact, perhaps, that you'd expect with the AC. What else can you do? Oh, they are the, going ahead. What the, else the, can you the, do? The, 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 first of all, let me deal with this business of Parliament has approved. Therefore, mm -hmm. when the fact that Parliament has approved doesn't make it the Bible or Quran. Okay. Okay? We've been in this country and it's been proven all over the world. Parliaments have approved even more serious things. Uh, VATs, I can give you VATs. It will be redrawn. You know why? Because you see, the foundation of everything that they are doing is based on falsehood. If you build on falsehood, it will collapse. I'm a spiritual man. You watch and see. The more they speak, the more foolish they will become. They will, they will lose total credibility. It's in their interest to stop this so that if they have an, a scintilla of credibility left there, eh, they'll keep it because the institution itself has to be protected. Where they are heading to, every day their credibility is going down the more. And the demonstration is just phase one. It's no, just one. Faces. Of course. It's just one among many, many other things. I'm saying that we're going to do everything politically and legally, constitutionally possible to stop it. Mark my words. We are not, we are not joking. <clears throat> We will do everything politically, legally, and constitutionally possible to stop it. It does not make sense. Look, we are in a country where we are doing national identification cards. Mm -hmm. They had a timetable of a year mm -hmm. to roll out. Have they done it? Their success rate, they are talking about 60% or so. Look at the challenges that we are going through. When they go to every region, breakdown of machines, people go and queue. Don't you feel sorry for our mothers, sisters, brothers, and uncles who go and queue 3 a.m., 2 a.m. just to get a national ID, a ID card? And when it comes to, and that has no direct bearing on elections. So when it comes to election matters, registering for elections, it creates much more tension. As for voting, on the day everybody takes his card to go and vote, it is registration that creates a lot of tension. And we are in an election year. You have not finished the procurement processes. You are not going to do your procurement processes. You say you are going to do registration in 50 days. So you are going to see the kind of chaos and confusion that is going to happen all, all across the country. You do not trust their process? It, 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 it's, it's a common sense and extrapolation, my brother. Common sense and extrapolation. Or, a, the, or the confidence in it, a system it, it, that you they know, have but confidence, you know, confidence is not in a vacuum. You understand me? If I have confidence in your station, it's because your station has a track record of delivery. And therefore, I can say I have confidence in you and your station. But if I'm listening to another station where there are breakages, today there's this, today there's that, if you ask me to have confidence in you, I have reason based on those past experiences to say, no, let's take a second look at it. These people need to upgrade their system. So, first of all, there is no consensus. 
there is the, 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 the issues that they are raising doesn't make sense. It, technically, it doesn't make sense. It's too costly. It's going to cost, by our calculation and estimation, mm -hmm. if we did an upgrade of the systems, we've had independent people to check, it will cost us just about 256 million Ghana cities. Mm -hmm. Not the over 800 million Ghana cities that they want to spend. In the face of we having budgeted to spend $1.5 billion dollars, on an NIA card. It, it just doesn't make sense. But what is wrong with us as a country? You, you've budgeted to spend $1.5 billion on an NIA card. The vice president has stated that subsequently, it is the NIA card that is going to be used for voting. You are spending time, energy, and you see there's a hidden cost that nobody is talking about. Which is? The time people go and spend to queue huh, at dawn, put stones there and wake up at dawn just to get their cards. You can't quantify it. People can get sick and die in that queue. I've seen it, it happened so many times in the Volta region and in other places. It, it, chaos, that is a huge cost to the state. And then the political parties, instead of us concentrating on our policies and programs and campaigning, will be spending time, energy and resources, fights here and there. Who knows if even if those Azugu boys will be all over the place chasing and beating people because they want to register. So why is it that? It just are, doesn't make sense. Why is it then that they are such certain political parties that do not seem to agree with you. Mm. You are leading a section. Mm. There also seems to be another section who say, well, this is fine. Don't they you held a press conference last week, same as you. Don't you see that it's very curious that the ruling MPP, mm -hmm. and you see, when we all agreed that they should give us those three documents, the consultant's reports, the mm -hmm. cost of upgrade, the cost of a new one, all of us as political parties agreed. When we went to the... Uh, evaluation meeting, because we do not have those documents, we withdrew. Ask the MPP whether they had documents. So what was the basis for which they went and agreed? So it's two things. Either they had the documents, which we didn't have, which would be very, very serious. I don't know whether they had it. Now, if they give them the documents and the other political parties as well, without that knowledge, then it tells you that this EC cannot be a fair umpire. Already, don't forget, Bosman Asari is on record to have said that the NDC is an existential threat to uh, Ghana's democracy. He even went further to say that the EC will not supervise the internal elections of the NDC. He refused to read. He doesn't know that the law man mandates them to supervise the internal elections of the NDC. That is hatred for, for, for a referee to say those things. Why do you put all those things aside? So we're saying that the, e, the MPP, particularly, mm -hmm. when they went to that evaluation meeting, if they had the documents, then that should tell you what kind of issue we had. Now, if they did not have those documents in order to make informed decisions, but they went there without the benefit of those documents, but then went and agreed to something, people can judge for themselves. Hmm. Interesting. So you're saying you're going to have faces of this, you're moving... There's going to be legal, there's going to be constitutional, there's going to be political. Mm. EC seems to... And the demonstration is just phase one. Tamale was wearing second gear. By the time we get to Accra, we'll be on the seventh gear. Have you seen a Camaro? You know a Camaro? Camaro, they have seven gears, right? Yes. Good. By the time we get to Accra, you see. No, I'm serious. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. Well, the EC also do not Okay, we to told you, we too. Yes, we told you, we are not joking. In any but case, at the end of the day, the hold on. At the, at the, at the, at the end of the day, who is making sense? The EC is not making sense. They are just not making sense in terms of processes and procedures. They are not being transparent. They are not being honest. And from the technical point of view, the, if they like, why don't they call a forum? They should call a forum. Bring all their experts. Eh? Mm -hmm. bring, don't even bring the NDC. Eh? Bring independent technical people. At the end of the day, you will see that what they're saying does not make any sense at all. Let me so you. it's either there is a hidden agenda, which by their own actions they seem to be confirming, because someone is where is your evidence? Oh, why? Anecdotal evidence, you look at you put two and two together, and the thing doesn't make sense, it appears. Or because, then it's a procurement thing. Because you know that in this country, procurement has become one of the ways by which people make money. Because whichever way you look at it, it just doesn't make sense. Let's sit down. Let's sit down. 
bring your IT people, MPP bring the IT people, NDC bring the IT people, other parties bring your IT people, the donors bring your IT people, uh, uh, stakeholders bring your IT people. Let's even have a one-day workshop. You remember when there was a controversy about bloating of the register? Mm -hmm. uh, what happened under the previous EC? We all went to Aliza, open with live coverage, nothing to hide. And the issues were put forth. The MPP had the opportunity to come and show us so-called 72,000 Togolese, whatever it is, they couldn't. The man himself who made the allegation couldn't come. He ran away and he sent somebody. He came, he, they, they shot. And the EC also did their own presentation. At the end of the day, it was proven that there was nothing like that. It went to the Supreme Court. We put in place a process to say that, look, let's clean the register, remove the names of those who used the NIA card. One of the things they've been saying is that the register is bloated. Mm -hmm. That is the most absurd reasoning I've ever heard. Why? Okay. Let me give you a little history. The reason why we had this biometric register was that this register was meant to be the end of all registers. Mm -hmm. So every four years, we go and queue, fight, beat people, register, over. So when you have a biometric register, when they take your biometric details, it's there forever. Forever. Nothing changes. So when people die, that's why they exhibit every year. People are supposed to go and help the EC to remove the names. Mm -hmm. Assuming that even those names are not removed, they don't pose a threat to the uh, 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 elections. Because why? If the person is dead, nobody can go and use his stamp to go and vote. You understand me? That's why you have a system that is 99.4 or 5% accurate. So where is about, what, what is it about the bloating? Now, let's even assume that at the time of that first registration in 2012, some parties managed to put minors on the roll, perhaps in NDC strongholds, in MPP strongholds, so people who were 13, 14, 15, let's assume that happened. Today, what would be the status of those people? By, the virtue, by virtue of that system, because they cannot register twice, mm -hmm. they would have reached the age of maturity. So the system would have cleansed them automatically. Now, if you go and open a register today, one thing that the biometric system, whether facial or tampering, cannot do is to determine the age of a person mm -hmm. and then the person's nationality. So you can have Bukinabes, excuse me for using that as an example, coming in, Eh? But there are thousands through some border, and they'll come and register. And you, once they're able to get some documentation, fake or genuine, to show, they'll register. That will be bloating. And then in strongholds of political parties, they can also get minors to register. Mm -hmm. So that, it doesn't solve the bloating problem. So this current register has within itself a self-cleansing mechanism to deal with bloating. And that is why the system was de designed such that once a month, the political parties are alerted and the system is opened, then everybody who has 10, 18 or who couldn't register otherwise is given the opportunity to register. And then every year, every two years, they also do the limited registration to add on. So that is a system that has been designed. It's there. All the documents are there to show this is the rationale. We spend time, money, effort to put the system in place. And now you are coming to bring a new system. You say facial recognition. We have proven to you that the facial recognition is not foolproof. It even has a lower resonance than the fingerprint. Now, I heard him yesterday saying that they will migrate the data mm -hmm. uh, from the, uh, the obsolete, the equipment that is obsolete and useless, mm -hmm. they will migrate the data. You see, that is a shift. That is not what they started saying in the first place. Because it doesn't make sense, you see. If you say you want to buy a new system, why then do you have to go and register? What about the data? No, there's nothing wrong with the data. Mm -hmm. If your phone, you, you change your phone, and maybe you're using an iPhone with uh, 64, whatever, whatever, and you change it to 132, do, does it mean that you have to call everybody who used to be on your contact, go to their houses, take their names again? Or if you go to the bank and open a bank account, and when the bank now wants to do a systems upgrade, do they call you to come and open a new bank account? No, they use your data that you have and create a new account. Then when you go to the bank, they'll say, we need this extra information, that extra information. So you see, whatever they're saying just does not make sense. Please, we all went to school. They should stop this nonsense. So for those who say, perhaps they have a good point, but it's the sense of timing of this that perhaps has the NDC and its friends. First of all, it's a very bad point, which they are not able to articulate because it's based on falsehood. 
Okay, if you are speaking the truth, we've been consistent. All this that we are saying, if you ask me a thousand times, if I sleep and wake up, you ask me, is this because it's the truth? Okay, they are not speaking the truth. Mm -hmm. They are they are lying. They are they've been deceptive. And you see, for me, okay, it's very very painful because Jemesa is like a sister and a friend. We work together at IEA. You understand me? Mm -hmm. And go and check. Have you seen her statement when she was in IEA? Which one? She Have you seen a lot of statements? Uh, about the EC allowing the political parties and allowing consensus at IPAC, etc. She said those things. Mm. It's been played back to her. So what has changed? She's the EC now. Yes. So you must be consistent, isn't it? Because at that time you were advising the then EC to allow transparency and to allow consistency and to allow consensus building. Now you are there. That is all the more reason why you should practice what you were preaching. Now you've turned 360 degrees, IPAC is not necessary, and you can do whatever you want. You cannot do whatever you want to. It's not your money. It is Ghana's money. It's not IEA money. It's not your husband's money. It is Ghana's money, and the people of Ghana have a stake in it. And if, God forbid, God forbid, anything happens to this country because of their intransigence, they think they'll go scot-free. The international community are watching. They are interested in this matter. So please, they shouldn't think that we are just, they can walk over everybody and do whatever they want to do. If they want, we, we, are, we have stated it formally. Mm -hmm. If we are called today, we sit down, say, look, suspend whatever you're doing. Let's sit down. What is the problem? Truly, truly, show us the evidence. We look at it, we examine it. We're not crazy people. We're reasonable people. We look at it, what can be done here, what can be done here. And then we'll do an upgrade, save this country some money. This is not a rich country. Masa, Accra is not Ghana. Accra is not Ghana. Go out there and see how people are suffering. You know? So 1 million, 10 million, 20 million, 100 million saving is a lot of money. So people shouldn't say, well, the budget has been approved so they can spend it in whichever way you are allowed. What are you talking about? The country, the Minister of Finance is always going around begging cap in hand, looking for uh, 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 raising bonds, left, right, center. So if we have some money and there's a way we can use it judiciously and cut down expenditure, that's what thinking people do. Mm. That's because it's been approved, so, oh, yo, yo, let's just go and spend it. It doesn't make sense. So the NDC is open to a meeting where perhaps the strategy can be re Of course. And We've discussed it. That that from the beginning. If not, yes. the NDC is going to resort to oh, whatever yeah. means necessary oh, yes. to make sure that this is pulled back. Oh, yes. And, 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 and you see, um, what we are doing, we are backed by God. And our ancestors, eh? and our forebears. There's a reason why our national anthem is that God bless our homeland and make our nation great and strong, both to defend forever the cause of freedom. Eh? You know, and then it says, and help us to resist oppressors' rule with all our will and with all our might. The easy is not the oppressor, Elvis. Eh, but is it not oppressive behavior? <laughs> eh? It's oppressive behavior with all our will and with all our might. So they don't understand history. That's why they are behaving that way. Because you see, people say, oh, you know, so MPP, uh, they, unfortunately, mm -hmm. by their conduct, they have allowed themselves to be linked with the MPP. That's their problem. But, oh, they will do whatever they want to do. That is even very bad. For a government, for anybody to say that an entity will do whatever they want to do, whether it's good or bad. It's not, that's not good PR. That's not something to be proud of. That we are so intransigent that even when it is bad and everybody is saying it, public opinion is against you, you will still go ahead and do it. The white men who came into this country and were taking our gold away, if they had their own, they would still be here. We chased them out without firing one shot. So we will stop them. Point well made. Since, since you are on this trajectory, let me ask you, though, we have very little time left. How is the campaign going? Because you are chasing the EC, yeah. but you are also chasing votes oh, yes, out of there for 2020. Of course, of course. I'm leaving There's tomorrow. I'm going to... To, to five regions. How's the campaign going? Very well. Solid. You are still soliciting public opinion for your manifesto? Of course. How is that? Are you getting any Fantastic, bright suggestions? Fantastic. Brilliant people ideas. People laughed at you when you... you well, that that's, that's their problem. I mean, people... For would, you, it works. Um, absolutely. You're going to serve the people. And, and I've told you, this is, this is management 101, administration 101, stakeholder buy-in. Mm. Okay, you want to govern the people. You may have some ideas, but you want to hear from the people themselves. Mm. Okay, so that that will feed into your policy formulation 
process. Mm -hmm. What is wrong with that? Well, people are saying it's because you have no bright ideas yourself. Well, that they can say. People can, somebody can drink a quotation and say anything, no. So if you worry about what anybody says, you don't know the state of the person when he said it. If somebody has drunk a quotation and is talking, then you too you are worried. <laughs> you must have conviction. You must have conviction and belief in what you are doing. You know, we're getting brilliant ideas, brilliant perspectives from ordinary people, from academia, from experts and all over, and we are putting all together. Okay. Or, don't forget that before we started that, there was already a policy group mm -hmm. that had put together the framework for our manifesto. You see, so really, and this thing about trying to rush us, where's your message? Look, we have the date, so the earliest we've ever come out with a manifesto, I think, was in June, right? June. You bring your manifesto, bring your uh, running mate. Some people don't have a flag bearer. MPP, do they have a flag bearer? Well, there's a presumptive flag bearer. But well, well, presumption is not presumption. He's not a flag bearer. We have a flag bearer. We you, have started the process of a manifesto. You have a flag bearer who's, yes. whose task is a very hard one, considering he's run the country before and lost mm -hmm. an election and is trying to mm -hmm. win back trust mm -hmm. of the people. Mm -hmm. You've been strategist for two elections. Mm -hmm. At the forefront. By the grace of God. And, and we always win. And we we'll win this and one you too. you are at the forefront. Again. Yes. What are you doing? What can you tell but me? I won't tell you. <laughs> you are not sharing it now. You. No, I won't tell you. <laughs> the results will speak for themselves. You are certain that you are going to get a positive result? Yes, of course. We are going to work very hard. Uh, do the things that can be seen and the things that cannot be seen. Mm -hmm. And ensure that we win. You know, we, we, it, it's going to happen. You see, not because it's been prophesied. I tell people, people say, oh, prophecy, prophecy. Yes, prophecy is important. So, um, let's say Abraham or Jesus, an angel appears to you and says, look, you're going to be a very huge farmer. You're going to have a bumper harvest. You say, hallelujah. They said, I'm going to uh, have a bumper harvest. And then you go and you're chilling at plus two, three, three. Eh? You will die of hunger. So that prophecy must then motivate you. If you had a 10-acre farm, you increase it to 100 acres. Work, weed, sow, make sure you remove the weeds, water it, guard it. Huh? And at the end of the day, God will pour his blessings on it and you will get your bump harvest. Okay. So it's a lot of thinking, planning, hard work and prayer. All right, then. Now, Mr. Freya Ankara, making, uh, giving us a bit of insight. He's refusing to share, though, the ones that we wanted to hear the most. We'll be back from our final break and wrap up the conversation on Face to Face. Welcome back to the final phase of Face to Face. Very interesting conversation with Director of Elections for the NDC, uh, Mr. Elvis Efriye. Elvis, you're saying President Mahama is on the road, he's working. W when are you picking a running mate? Um, there is a process uh, that involves the Council of Elders and their neck. So I have full confidence in them that they will do the right thing at the right time. That one is above my pay grade. I'm focusing on the EC and operational matters. That's where my focus is. Those who, those who have to take care of that too, they will take care of this. Operational matters also include money. What you do involves a lot of money, specifically the job mm -hmm. that you have. Mm -hmm. Fortunately... Does the NDC have money? No, nobody has money. No opposition political party has money anywhere you know mm. but you create money you find money and there is something more important than money Which that is goodwill commitment dedication you cannot buy with money when you have that you will get what you need to execute a successful campaign you understand me mm. you can have oodles of money a room full of money if you don't have goodwill if you don't have dedication commitment focus you you will lose so we know the MPP, they have money. They've printed new notes, plenty money. We wish them luck. We, we have goodwill. We are focused. We have a candidate who has been tried and tested. Everybody knows him. What he did for this country is there for everybody to see. And of course, we also recognize and acknowledge that we made mistakes. Very important. Have you acknowledged? Of course. We've been consistent. We've been saying that. Where, where did you make these acknowledgements? Oh, when we like were, where? we've been saying this consistently. Recently, we had a program <clears> here. Uh, what was it that we launched? The party saying, or the former president oh, the himself former saying, president himself. that he made mistakes yes, as president. of course. He said it. Give me one several, example. Example. Of him saying he made a mistake. When? Oh, he has said it. What was the program that we had here um, recently? We did something here. It was here, right in this hall. 
Mm. Um, somebody we did. We he did said this to his party, or he said this to the country. To the public, it was it was there was live coverage. Mm. You know, when the manifesto committee were being introduced, mm -hmm. it was live here, and he, he acknowledged, indeed. And so, so we've acknowledged that yes, there were mistakes, and we'll correct those mistakes when we come back to power. But I mean, you look at the record, just see. Yes, see, they said uh, the CD was not performing well and that blah, blah, blah. Today you can see the CD, somebody arrested it and gave the keys to the IGP. Now that IGP has been removed. I'm sure he took the key to his village. <laughs> but but the, numbers, the numbers do support no. the claims that they have made, the, the MPP have made. The, the numbers do support. People have been running polls consistently for the past three months. Every time the people of Ghana say they are tired, they are hungry. What is them? The IMF, mm -hmm. uh, recently, they warned the government that they are yes. cooking numbers. Didn't you see it? The, the IMF said uh -huh. that Ghana should be careful of debt distress. I don't mm. recall a line that said you are cooking numbers. Oh, but that the is, cooking that numbers is, was NDC. That, that, that is a diplomatic way of they putting no, it. No, the we cooking understand. numbers was actually we are, we are, we are, we understand. Let's, we understand. Let's put that around. We are, we are understand. NDC accused the government we are, we of cooking understand. numbers. We understand that kind of language. You know, when the IMS begin to send, are you, are you aware that they've also said that they should increase VAT and that revenue has gone down drastically? They should increase VAT and increase other taxes. And all these things are, these are things that if your candidate comes to power, he will find a way around. But, but you, you, they were the ones who were accusing us that we had too many taxes and all that. And they came and they said, you know, there was so kind of false taxes and all those things. And what happened? So we're saying that when we now begin to go back to the people, it's going to be one. These are the things that the people say. We'll look at them, the things that they said they would do. And then we'll look at our own track record and the new program that we are bringing. And we are confident that if you look at all those things and you look at the persona, personality of John Mahama and everything and insecurity under this Akufuado government. He, he's, the one, he's the one who shocks me most. Akufuado. What has he done to you? Hey. The, the, the human man who has delivered the human, return. Human, the human, human right. Oh, I'll give him some little credit for that. I mean, let's be honest. Year of return, you know, even though I have issues with some of the ways he was managed. But human rights lawyer, advocate, and under you, we saw this Ayawa So West thing. And then when a commission brings out its reports, you put it aside, and the people are working free. You know the implication of that. Let me tell you this, and listen carefully. I'm listening. As director of elections, you know the problem, one of the problems I'm facing. And it, when we finish with this register, that's the next thing I'm going to deal with. The young man asked me, so you people, we were beaten at Ayawaso West Wagon. You told us to come down. We'll have justice. After that, one MPP national executive you said we should wait for commission's report reports came out nothing came out of it one mpp regional executive publicly said that ayawaso west wagon was a dress rehearsal the real beating is going to be in 2020. nobody reprimanded him not the media not civil society not the clergy everybody pretended they had not heard it see no evil hear no evil speak no evil so they're asking us this guy is threatening us and by the silence of the state, the party, and all, it means that people endorse it. So are you telling us that we should sit down, put our hands in our demerifa, and go and wait for us to be beaten and shot at again? The last time we met one of the civil society organizations, I asked him, I said, this is my problem. Can you give me an answer? He hasn't given me an answer. So I'm asking you. This is what they're asking me. What should I tell them? What can I tell you? What, can I tell you? what, can I, what I can tell you is that your time is up, though. Uh, my, my, you know, dear, my time, <laughs> time is, up. is up. Okay. Thank you very they much. They said they are preparing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you much, very much, Mr. Abu Zafri. It's okay. been a pleasure <laughs> being my first guest on Face to Face. And even before I go out, we, we can never meet without discussing a bit of football. We, we, we are told we are going to get a new national team coach. CK Akono. Is that the name that surprises you? Well, not really. CK is a good guy. Mm. He's a cool guy. I've engaged with him, you know. And uh, I think we see has been given all the opportunity that anybody could get. So um, if there's a new face, well, that's a decision within their domain. So mm -hmm. I hope that uh, maybe another Ghanaian gets it, maybe with technical support from an outsider. I don't know. But uh, right. 
I'm cool. All right, former sports minister giving yeah. us his input on yeah. uh, a sporting decision. Although these days he tries to hide away from the sports. Yeah. It's been a pleasure coming your way with the first episode of Face to Face. I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Honorable Elvis Efriyanka. My name is Godfrey Akutubuafo. Have a good day. <laughs>